Minnesota just made their first conference final since Kevin Garnett. And when we're constantly hearing about how Anthony Edwards is the new Michael Jordan, or how the Wolves would actually be better if they just banned Rudy Gobert from the arena, it's easy to forget about the rest of the team. In particular, the second team all-defensive member who just had three straight 20-point games. Jaden McDaniels is one of those unique defensive talents who can pretty much guard whoever the team wants him to. He started out the Phoenix series matched up with Booker and absolutely hounded him for 94 feet to make his life hell. He spent some time on the more agile Beal as well, where his own lateral quickness and length were more than effective. He's listed at 6'9 with a 7'0 wingspan, so naturally he was also their best option against Kevin Durant, as he's the only one who can actually contest his shot without giving up separation. Then in the Denver series, he spent some time on Jamal. Again, full court pressure and being a constant pest, but actually they wanted him to spend more time on Porter Jr. due to the size and length, where he's still in a position to force himself into actions and make plays on the ball. He's able to create chaos, not only because of the length and agility, but also the fact that he's got some really sharp hands. All I want you to focus on here is his right hand. The way he tracks the ball to its release point is very reminiscent of Kawhi. Much like Kawhi, what makes him such an incredible perimeter defender is his lateral quickness. The way he moves his feet at that size makes it so tough for anyone to beat him off the dribble. And even if they do get a step down the lane, like here Booker's able to get into the paint, Jaden's huge, so by making himself tall, he's almost serving as a big at the rim. Oftentimes what slashers will do to counter this coverage is initiate contact as a way to throw the defender off balance, only that doesn't really work against Jaden for two key reasons. First is what I've already talked about with the length and sharp hands. Jokic goes right into his chest and he swipes down at the ball to force a turnover. Second is an actual defensive technique that only the very best have mastered. It's like a perimeter version of pulling the chair. The idea of initiating contact is to get the defender off balance, so what he'll do is backpedal early and not let the contact occur, which then flips the script and makes the offensive player lose balance. And when it all comes together, I'm not sure there's a player better at defending drives. You've got the agility to cut Booker off, the backpedal to make him lose balance, then the length to swarm the ball and deny a finish. As a result, most offensive players make a business decision to not take him in isolation and instead use screens. But just when you think you lost him, he's right back in the play like he's got a teleportation device. Because he's such a fluid athlete and has such a skinny frame, he's one of those guys who can stay attached to his man over the top of screens pretty much every time, and then all of those other tools I talked about sort of fall into place. On this one, it's Durant who tries to lose him with a cross screen, only for him to immediately peel onto the roller and steal a pass. And here he does the exact same thing against the Nuggets two-man game, pressuring Jamal at half court and reaching one of those long arms into the passing lane. When he absolutely has to stay glued to his man, you'll often see him use his arms as a way to keep that connection, and the downside is that it can result in a decent amount of fouls. In general, he has a tendency to be a little more hands-on than this era allows, so if you wanted to point at one weakness in his perimeter defense, it would be the amount of avoidable fouls. However, even in the rare event that the screen hits him hard or he's just beat, he's one of those rare guys who has to be tracked at all times. You could make the argument that he's just as scary in rear pursuit as he is in front of the ball. Booker puts him in jail, plays in between, finds some space on a drive, only for his layup to get pinned off glass. And knowing that Jaden's chasing them from behind, offensive players will often speed up their attack rushing shots or decisions, which can really take them out of their rhythm. Basketball players often talk about being in the zone, where their focus is laser sharp and they enter a sort of flow state. But what happens when that intense focus starts to bleed into other areas of life? Personally, I've struggled every day with something I call overworking. It's where my mind just can't seem to shut off from the content. I'd find myself declining invitations or just struggling to unwind after days simply because I didn't think I could afford to take the time away from making videos. It's like no matter what I was doing or where I was, I was constantly thinking about how I could be more productive, and that took a toll on my overall well-being. That's when I realized that talking to 
to a professional could really help me out. Sometimes having an unbiased perspective or just someone to talk to can make a huge difference in finding a healthy work-life balance. If you've ever found yourself in a similar situation, I want to introduce you to today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online therapy platform that makes it easy and convenient to connect with a licensed therapist from the comfort of your own home. With over 30,000 therapists in their network, BetterHelp can match you with the right professional based on your specific needs and preferences. Whether you prefer video chats, phone calls, or even messaging, BetterHelp offers a therapy format that works best for you. And if you feel like your therapist isn't the perfect fit, you can easily switch to a new one at no additional cost. Take the first step towards prioritizing your mental health and well-being by visiting betterhelp.com slash hoopvenue or selecting hoopvenue at signup for a special discount on your first month of therapy. With all of that said, I think you could make a case that Jaden is the best point of attack defender in the NBA. Sure, there might be guards out there who are more agile and maybe more disruptive with their hands, or some bigger wings who are stronger and more physical, but when it comes to checking boxes, from defending different types of players to blowing up the pick and roll, he's probably the most versatile. Where he truly separates himself from these other guys, though, is with what he's capable of doing away from the ball. When needed, he can play the role of a low man incredibly well, not only rangy enough to cover a ton of ground quickly, but with the verticality to offer serious resistance at the rim. I mean, how many wings can you say will make a 7-footer upfake when they're rotating down? That's not at all normal. And part of the reason this Wolves defense is so historic is the way they overwhelm teams with size. Having a guy like McDaniels at the three is a big catalyst in making that happen. So overall, he's Minnesota's ultimate defensive chess piece. Whatever they need him to do, he can execute, which alone would make him an invaluable role player. But what about the other side of the ball? Almost all of his time on offense is spent spotting up on the perimeter, so naturally his value is often tied to how well he's shooting the ball. And to start the playoffs, he wasn't doing too well. In the Phoenix series, he shot just 3 of 11, or 27.3%. Then in the first five games of the Denver series, he stayed just as cold, shooting 2 of 12. Meaning that through 9 total games, he was barely over 20% on his 3-pointers. It got to a point where the Nuggets were actively scheming to leave him open, and he couldn't make them pay. The thing is, 23 shots is a minuscule sample, and we have large amounts of evidence suggesting he's a way better shooter than that. Over the last three seasons, he's hit just under 41% of his wide open threes, well above average, which tells me that as the playoff sample increases, he's due for positive regression. And that's precisely what happened. Over the next three games, he shot a combined 12 of 17, a scorching 70.6%, ultimately being the swing factor in that crucial Game 7 win. And once the shots get going, establishing that threat, it starts to open up other avenues, such as his off-the-catch slashing. He's a really impressive athlete, with pretty good touch around the rim, which adds another layer to his scoring beyond the spot-up threes. One thing I especially like is his feel for filling out space, often repositioning himself to create easier lanes to attack, but even more importantly is what he's capable of doing if he gets cut off. On this one, he crosses to his right for a hesitation before spinning back to his left for a tough finish through contact. And his handle is significantly more advanced than a typical role player. Again, it's the right hand hesitation and his length allows him to cover a ton of space on both the cross and the layup. Here's another example. He tries to drive right, gets shut off and pulls back to his left, then uses that space to get to a pull-up jumper. This in-between game is his go-to counter. Whenever he can't get all the way to the rim, you'll see him hunt for short jumpers, and he's legitimately good in these spots. He'll use shoulder bumps, he'll turn around to create space. These are the plays that suggest serious offensive development. So when the three ball is hitting, he may not be a creator in the traditional sense, but he's capable of utilizing all three levels as a shot maker, which goes a long way for the versatility of his team with him as a third or fourth option. He can generate some pressure off the catch, and although he's not at all some really impressive passer, he's shown to be willing and capable of making those reads when they're available. For the most part, that covers about 80-90% to 90 of his attack. 
Occasionally, you'll see him used as a cutter, whether that's in set action or on the baseline, again weaponizing his athletic finishing. But something else that kind of came out of nowhere in this run has been his ability to crash the glass as an offensive rebounder. He's averaging 2.3 offensive rebounds a game, which is the third most of any non-big man, many of which result in putbacks. You also throw in the fact that his athleticism is really effective in the open floor, often as a result of his own defensive creation, and I won't say he's some high-level number three, but he's certainly giving you more offense than the average role player. When the shots are hitting like they have been recently, we're talking about an S-tier role player. The multi-layered scoring, the off-ball game, but more importantly than anything, his elite defense. He's playing a vital role for a Wolves team that's looking to compete for a championship. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you think of McDaniels. As always, I hope you all have a great day and I'll catch you guys in the next one.